afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Martina Zucker Gonzalez, and I'm the co chair of the Student Lecture Series Committee here at the Cooper Union's Urbanist Channel School of Architecture. Today, we are happy to be joined by Ruben Polendo. Uh, Ruben Polendo is founding artistic director of Theater Media. Polendo's practice and pedagogical work are situated in the tension between acting and performance, theatrical design and installation multimedia and interactive technology. Theater Mito is located in its own art space in Gowanus, Houston, called Mito Party. His former dash recycling facility is a unique gallery space where transdisciplinary art practice is interrogated, incubated, and produced. His work with Mito has been presented and developed nationally and internationally. Theater Mito has been company in residence of the Public Theater, the New York Theater Workshop, and the NYU Abu Dhabi Art Center. Polendo served as the founding theater program director and associate dean for the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. And Polendo most recently served as the chair for the Department of Drama at NYU Fish School of the Arts. As always, we'd like to thank Elise Joss and Jeffrey Brown for their continued support for the student lecture series. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ruben Polendo. Um, hi, folks. How are you? Yeah, uh, I'm really loud, so everyone can hear me okay? Uh, don't forget, I'm in theater, so I'm loud. Uh, uh, thanks so much for coming. I know this is part of the, the lunch uh, uh, break work, lecture series all mushed up together. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll engage in the conversation and leave a little time for questions uh, and a little time for as well. Um, thank you, Martina. Thanks to everybody uh, for inviting me to come join you all. Um, uh, I know we're new to each other, and I wish we could spend like an hour, because I want to know about all your projects and your work, uh, but hopefully I learn, I'll learn a little bit about that as we engage in the conversation. Um, so uh, what I would love to do is give you a little bit of context as to who the hell I am and why I'm here, uh, uh, and then talk a little bit about my work in theater performance and how it bridges into the work of architecture and space. Uh, my hope is uh, to either shed some new light, new ideas that are coming from a space of performance, um, or uh, have a reframing of things that are already in part of your practice and part of your work as we travel through it. Um, I will say a couple of, of things. One is, um, as we go through uh, the work, uh, please feel free to, to interrupt after a question, anything of that sort. Again, we'll leave some time for some questions, uh, but I want to make sure it doesn't just shower as information on you as we travel through the work. Um, secondly, uh, you should know that I am Mexican, and I say this because my first language is Spanish. I come from northern Mexico. And it's what they call the speed rim of Spanish, which is I talk really fast. Um, so if at any point you're like, I'm hearing a lot of words, but I have no idea what you said, just feel free to be like, can you say that again? Uh, that's not a problem. I'm part of the rim that covers the Caribbean and Cuba and Puerto Rico and all that. So if you hear me in Spanish, you get faster than this. Um, so I hang in there with me a little bit. Um, yeah, everybody ready? Okay, you can see this okay? Everybody can see that? Okay, great. Um, so uh, uh, we'll talk a little more formally about Theater Me Too. But again, uh, my name is Ruben Polendo. I'm the founding artistic director of Theater Me Too. Uh, as Martina mentioned, uh, I'm also a professor uh, for uh, Tish Drama at NYU, just right across the way. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's thrilling to be here because you should know, right, this is a great mysterious building. We don't know what happens in here. Everybody, I, I walked out, I was like, I'm going to Cooper. They're like, how did you get in there? I'm like, what's happening? So, uh, so I feel like a pioneer coming in here, though we've had colleagues certainly be in conversation. Uh, so it's a great privilege uh, to be here. I, I want to give you a little context about myself, which I hope will make my work legible. I, I do think that the work of artists, and I group us as artists, and I'll talk about that word in a moment, um, I, I do feel strongly that so much of it is tethered to who we are, to, to, to our, our experience as we travel through the world. Uh, there's a few things that I think, again, make my work legible. First of all, as I mentioned, I come from uh, Mexico. Particularly, I grew up on the border between Mexico and the U.S. in a city called Juarez, which is right across from El Paso, Texas. Uh, uh, that creates a whole host of, of way of living and breathing and being. If any of you come from any borderland situation, you know it's a really unique experience. And again, borderlands can happen outside of geography. They can happen in spaces of identity. It can happen in spaces of your own traveling of the world. For me, it happened quite literally geographically. I grew up crossing borders. I always joke that, you know, we would go get milk on the American side and bread on the Mexican side because my dad wouldn't eat the bread from the U.S., but wouldn't touch the milk from me. Like, it's all these things were my reality. And when I came to the U.S., I was like, not everybody does that? Y'all don't go to another country to get bread? It was like, nope, nope, just grew up in my town. Uh, and so for me, that becomes really important because I identify as a borderlander. 
not only in terms of my own identity, but also in my work. I'm actually interested in crossing bridges, the bridge between Tisch and Cooper Union, uh, uh, the bridge between theater and architecture. So that excites me and interests me greatly, and it's part of who I am. As I moved into the US, uh, my undergraduate degree, which is what I came to the US for, is not in theater at all, it's in biochemistry. So another bridge and border there. So just to be clear, you're speaking to a scientist whose practice is theater, and I'm at an architecture engineering art school. So you can see the motif of things that, that excite me. So biochemistry for me was a really meaningful field, and I got into it because actually I didn't know what the hell to study, and I like puzzles. Um, I, I love puzzles. I still do. You know, I love any kind of puzzle. I have three sisters, and whenever their little gold chains get into a knot, I'm like, give it to me. I'll unknot it, or like Christmas lights, or stuff like that. Um, so, so puzzles were interesting. So I was okay by it. I, I could do it. I can navigate it. It wasn't very inspiring to me, but I, I could travel through it. In my third year in college, um, I had an existential crisis. Um, as you get to know me, you'll know I'm very dramatic about things. So I had an existential crisis. Crisis, and I decided that the world made no sense to me. Science didn't make sense to me. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and my advisor, a professor, very kindly told me, okay, calm the F down uh, and uh, let's have you go study abroad for a moment. And so I went to a program in the UK uh, that focused on biochemistry. When I arrived there, um, I was really lonely. I was actually quite miserable. The, the science was exciting, but I didn't know anybody there. It was a new cultural context. And there was a little board that said, the theater program needs some scientists to come advise on a piece of theater that we're making. I'd never been involved in theater. I didn't grow up in a theater family. I didn't know what was going to happen. But at the bottom, it said, come have some food and make friends. And literally, I was like, friends, I'll do anything for friends. So I went and I showed up. And that moment changed my life completely. I walked into this rehearsal room of theater makers and saw something that I had not yet seen in my field of science, which is something that I would argue we all share, which is I walked into a room of people dreaming and then creating. This was tectonic, this was massive, right? Literally people were saying, well, why don't we do this? And then they would do it. They would do it in a model, they would do it in a room, they would do it in a song, they would do it. I sat there addicted. There is absolutely creativity in the sciences, but it's a very different process. It's about data and observations and hypotheses and theoretical. But to have somebody be like, well, why don't we just make it go higher here and lower here? And then they would build it. Literally, I was like, what, that's a thing? We do that, right? And to me, that was really exciting and meaningful. And so. They asked us our science questions and everybody left. And I was like, I want to stay. I want to not leave this room. And I realized that for me, creation is such an important part of what we do because I feel strongly it is one of the most important things that we do as humans, that we create. And the act of creating is a really potent one. We'll unpack that a little bit in a moment. So my life would change. I came back to the US and I was like, I want to do something totally different. I want to go into, into the arts, into theater. Everybody thought I was on my mind. Um, but again, when I was when I was doing this work, uh, I kept being affected by this question of, 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 of art, right? When I was in England, I went to see a performance company that had come from southern India. It was a kind of performance called Katakali. I'd never heard of this performance. I went to see it because I'd make friends and they were going. Uh, and so we went to see this work. And again, it's the second point that truly changed my life. It was this incredibly visual, sculptural, architectural, intellectual, and spiritual form. It really came together in this massive way. I, I sat there completely addicted to it. I, I went to the back of the stage and I spoke to the artists and I said, how can I see more? How can I do more? And they said, come to India. Uh, and I thought, I, I will. I guess I will. And I wrote this bullshit paper uh, to get funding on getting uh, biochemistry research funding to go to public health research in a small community. I didn't even know what I was writing. I was like, I just must get myself to. And I got the grants to do it. And I did do my public health research. But that's not why I was there. I, I was there to explore this art form. And it was intense. And it was interesting. And it was fascinating. And again, it stimulated what I was waiting for, which is commitment to experimentation, still like I have in sciences. I was interested in making an impact in the community. But my medium would no longer be scientists. It would be art. It would be storytelling. It would be image making. It would be the building and the making of the work that would shape my work as a theater maker. So again, I came back to the US, turned my life around, started training as a theater maker, went to grad school, started really investing in what that was that I was after, right? But I invite you to, to think of those two moments because that really functions as the seed for what is, what is to be my work. Uh, and as I travel through that, um, I just want to show you a quick image just so you can see this is um, what uh, Katakali performance looks like, um, just to give you a sense. So if you haven't seen it, I hope you will agree that it looks pretty intense already, right? It's visually really stunning. 
Um, not really the music was incredible. I love music. And so the music was really stunning. Uh, the, the puzzle of the storytelling was really remarkable. It was intellectually engaging, but it was actually quite spiritually moving. Not spiritual in a way that was sort of religious or theological, but something that made you feel greater than yourself, right? It's the kind of reaction that we often have in front of nature, right? And many of you grew up near big mountains or the ocean, and you sit there and you're like, the ocean is limitless. The... I went to the Grand Canyon a few years ago for the first time, and I walked up to the edge of the Grand Canyon and was like, look at it. And when I opened my eyes, I was like, humanity is limitless and we are nothing. Like I had this like deep moment. Everybody was like, calm down. We're going to check it out for a few days. But to me, what was exciting was actually this realization of the spectrum of human existence. And to me, that's a spiritual experience. That's something that conjures a kind of spirit in you. And in many ways, this did a version of that, which was exciting. So again, keep in mind this borderlander quality. Keep in mind that secretly and not so secretly, I'm a scientist. And that's how I was trained, even though I've received my training and so forth in theater. That's still how I organize information. And then, of course, this Katakali uh, uh, notion, which really started giving a seed to what would become my theater company. So. In graduate school, I gathered a group of artists who were interested in these same ideas, even though I didn't have the language for it. And I gathered them in the only way I knew how to gather people, which is like a biochemistry laboratory. I brought people together with a space of exploration, of experimentation, um, and really around this idea of what I had seen in, in this performance of Katakali and in this work. And so it started to create a vision for what would become the company Theater Me Too. And the core of that vision is this idea of whole theater, right? which is a theatrical experience that is rigorously visual, that is aural, that is emotional, that is intellectual, and that is spiritual, all in the same moment. And so often the art experience is one where we witness and then we react, right? So think of performance, think of theater, think of even film, right? Something happens on screen or on stage and you react. Something funny and you laugh, something sad and you cry. So there's kind of syncopation to the rhythm of how you witness that work, right? There is something that happens when that syncopation joins, it goes like this, and you get the chills, everybody feels it in the room, you go, ah, right, something happens. That electric feeling is what we call this whole theater experience. We believe that that's a moment where you're engaged fully and at your broadest in that experience. The proposal to me, to the company, was what happens if you create something that from beginning to end is that? Right, that it actually doesn't go into syndication, but it's actually that whole experience from beginning to end. Would we collapse? Would you be like, leave me alone? I don't know what this is. What would happen with that intensity, right? And is that even possible? Well, this really started the work of the company towards exploring these ideas. We came to the conclusion that one of the best ways to do that was actually to look at our field of theater in a whole other way and to really commit to the idea of innovation. And you'll find that this is a big part of the work that really drives my company and really gives shape to Theater Me Too's mission, uh, which is Theater Me Too is a permanent group of collaborators thinking in like a biochemistry lab. So we've worked together for over 20 years. The newest company members have been with the company for what, five or six years. And so we really commit to this work, again, driven by a commitment to innovation. The company expands the definition of theater through methodical experimentation with its form. So anything that in your mind right now, you think when I say the word theater, I'm not interested in that. I'm actually interested in pushing beyond that and questioning what is theater in its largest sense and how can we push boundaries. And I'm interested in that in every field, because you'll hear this word in a moment, we have all these inheritances of how something should happen. And though that's great knowledge, I feel our responsibility is to move that line forward into new ways of thinking and new modes of creating. And this idea of exploring in a, method in a methodical way is really important. Um, with a global view, the company engages transdisciplinary arts practice as research. Um, and I wanna talk about that sentence in a moment, but I just wanna give you a few visuals so you have a sense of this. So Theater Michu's work is quite physical, it's very visual, um, and it looks, I'm gonna turn this off for a second. Um, and it looks as space as a really key consideration, right? And it's quite a holistic space and a kind of largest to that. Uh, so that the performance isn't something that's simply localized in the body, but it's actually quite panoramic, right? Um, technology is a big part of the work. This is from a performance that we actually just closed two weeks ago uh, at New York Theater Workshop just down the way. Um, uh, and again, it looks at this really large scale involvement of the performer and the audience, right, as we travel through the work. But again, the predominant idea is certainly that it becomes this very uh, 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 surrounded and embedded space for you um, as an audience and as a witness to it. And again, you'll see technology uh, present repeatedly in the work. Um, 
Everybody can see these slides a little bit. It's hard for me to tell from here. I realize I'm so close to them. Um, and again, uh, uh, you know, if if there's uh, in, this is just a quick example of the work. Is there, if there's more interest, you can check out tons of work on on our website. Um, but again, this is the mission of the company. So I want to talk through a couple of uh, uh, words that are really important to this. And it's these words, right? Um, first of all, I want to talk about uh, this word theater, right? And, and what it means for us. And, and you'll see that it'll start making bridges for us. Um, so for us, theater is a, is a mode of research, of engaging in research, right? For me, the work of an artist and how we make work is constantly research. Academic institutions define research as the following, which I think is, is an awesome uh, de definition, which is it's the uh, action of interrogating, of investigating and of innovating your field. And so for me, that is such a key part of the work that we do in the making of work, that we're constantly interrogating, why do we do this? How do we do it? How do we do it anew? We're investigating, right? The idea of looking deeper as to the historical context and right, we're creating new modes and new ways of working, which to me becomes a really exciting way to look at the work, right? So theater me is committed to research um, and our field of course is theater. And so this gets to what's often called the research frame, right? So think about frame, what are we researching? And for us, it's theater. So I'm going to give us a really broad or capacious definition of theater um, that allows for this kind of investigation. So I'm gonna invite us to think of these two uh, uh, sides of, of the screen. One is the source and the other is the witness, right? The source, again, being, I'm gonna call it the art, right? And the witness being the audience, right? So think of the art piece and think of the audience, right? For us, this space in between, right? is what I'm inviting us to call theater for the sake of the research, right? That's a really broad definition. So I'm essentially saying that anything that is viewed by an audience, I'm inviting us to interrogate what happens if we call it theater, right? What questions does it bring up? Often what it brings up is associations that you have with theater, right? So if I stand outside of this building and I sit with three of you and I say, let's view this building as theater, one of you might say, well, no, it's not theater, it doesn't have actors. That means you have an assumption that theater must have actors, right? I want to push that, right? And ask, does it have to have actors? And somebody says, well, it doesn't have a script. There's an assumption that it must have a script, right? And so all of a sudden, the conversation brings up a whole host of inherited values that may be limiting innovation, right? We could truly sit in the middle of a park and say, as researchers, let's look at people moving in space and call it theater. Well, it's not memorized. So you think all theater must be memorized. Right? Well, it's not choreographed, so you think theater should have choreographed. So all of a sudden it unpacks these things that we almost don't know that we believe in this. One could argue that the same could be said about any field, right? I can invite you to look, of course, at the building, and we can speak about the architecture, but I can also invite you to look at a piece of fashion and say, let's talk about the architecture of this. And if you say, well, that's not architecture because you see the inheritances. Now, you may be interested in those inheritances, but for me, it's exciting to actually recognize them, to know that these are the kind of ghosts in the room that are shaping the field. That makes sense as an idea. Y'all hanging in there? Okay, hang in there with me. It gets it gets it gets weirder. All right. So keep this in mind. Again, this is a research question. So it isn't that I'm saying everything's theater. We're gonna go watch theater. The idea is what happens when we begin to look at anything that's witnessed as theater. And I'm a big geek about that. Like if you're walking with me somewhere and the sun begins to set, I'm like, let's look at the sunset as theater. You're like, Ruben, shut it down. Like we're not in research mode, right? But again, I guess what happens? And I'll say, because it's beautiful, actually, so theater is beautiful for you. So it brings up these questions of what we expect from that space, right? I'm gonna give us an even loftier definition of this question of theater. And I'm gonna send us back a little bit in time to this incredible document that comes out of uh, the Vedic world, so out of Hinduism, it's called the Natya Sastra. This book has a whole legend as to how it was manifested. It dates from about 500 BCE. And this is the key thing of the Natya Sastra, and you'll see that it connects our fields. So in the Natya Sastra, uh, there's this incredible story that says that humanity, now we're going to go to mythology, all right? Humanity was destroying itself. It was destroying itself with rage, with anger, and with violence. The gods in the mythology have a meeting. If you know anything about Hinduism, the gods love having meetings in Hinduism, so they have a meeting. And the king of the gods uh, uh, brings up this problem and says something must be done. There's a very important deity, a god named Shiva, who says, I have created something that will actually resolve this and make 
humanity survive all of this darkness, but I must impart it in something, some human, right? So they must search all over the earth for this one human, right, that can hold all of this. And they find one, and the name of this human is Bharata. Now, Bharata is an old word for artist or maker, which I think is sort of fascinating and interesting, right? So Bharata goes to sleep and has a dream. And in the dream, he speaks to the gods and so forth. When Bharata wakes up, in front of Bharata are the five children of Bharata. So magically, Bharata has given birth to these five children. And these are the five children of Bharata. The first one is music. You really just go. The next one is poetry. The next one is story. The next one is architecture. And the next one is theater, right? These are the five children of Bharata. And the idea is that these are the five keys into humanity existing and subsisting in peace and joy. I, I think it's a pretty great story as it comes up, right? The thing it further states is this idea that actually within these children of Bharata, they are all woven through each other. The notion being that poetry has an element of music to it or musicality. And if you've ever heard really beautiful poetry, it does. It has this kind of sense of music, right? The idea is that story has an element of poetry and music. Right. And again, if you've ever heard a storyteller or a really beautiful story, it has an element of the poetic. And then it begins to get more conceptual, which is the idea that architecture has an element of music, of poetry, of story. Right. That's a pretty lofty ask to begin to think in those terms. Right. And then, of course, it claims that theater has an element of music, poetry, story, and architecture. And again, that they all lead back into each other so that architecture has an element of theater, right? Poetry has an element of theater and architecture and so forth. I like these kind of poetic asks because it invites us to think of our field in a little bit of a different way, right? It invites us to think as we make your work say in architecture for me in theater, to say, what is the poetry in it? What is the story in it? What is the music in it, right? And what ideas do those kind of questions ask, right? And again, my favorite is that this isn't an idea that comes from yesterday. This is from 500 BCE, right? Which is a place that we rarely can even place in our imagination as we travel through the work. The other thing this offers is a, 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 an idea that I shared earlier, this word, that I think is a really, really exciting contemporary con uh, uh, concept, an idea, which is the idea of the transdisciplinary art. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I don't want to shape that word a little bit for us, right? Um, interdisciplinary, you know this word, yeah? If I say interdisciplinary, what do you think of when you think of interdisciplinary? interdisciplinary? Is there a brave soul that can give me an interdisciplinary a shot at that? Uh, bridge in between disciplines. Yeah, 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 yeah. A bridge between disciplines, yeah. So uh, that's actually a perfect de description, which is, you know, I can say I'm a theater maker, we bring a filmmaker, an architect, a songwriter, and we're going to work together, right? We're going to create this interconnection, right? So what does transdisciplinary mean, right? To me, it's a really exciting idea, and it's the idea that as someone with a particular training in a field, you can work in this in-between space that is not your expertise, but you're bringing those expertise to that towards innovation. So what does that mean? The idea being this, that as, and, and to some folks it sounds exciting, it sounds, it sounds insane, which is here you are as let's say a, a trained architect, right? The idea being, so now can you write a song? Not as a songwriter, but as an architect. How does an architect write a song? Not because it's gonna become a pop hit, but what do we discover about structure in that exercise, right? What do we discover that innovation, right? Can I, as a theater maker, uh, suddenly uh, uh, create a dance, right? What do we learn about that? This trans space, this liminal space, and acknowledging that that's a very real space, right? But in fact, there's a discovery because all of a sudden, I don't have the inheritances of that form. I'm actually bringing my own form into that. So if you were to write a song, right, it would be very different than someone that's going to the Columbia School of Music who is learning premises of theory and all these ideas and actually, for better or for worse, have some of that inheritance. Again, I'm not saying that you're going to create the best song in the world, but what do you learn about your field, about structure, about contemplations that you have in your field? And so that transdisciplinary space to me is really interesting. Again, different and as valid as interdisciplinary, but I find it to be a really exciting space for that. You hanging in there? Yeah, okay, all right. Um, so I, I'm going to make a, a leap here um, to talk a little bit about the, the, uh, uh, the, the main construct of the work that we're going to talk about. And it's this word, which is dramaturgy, right? So 
So dramaturgy is a really interesting theater word that I'm gonna invite us to extrapolate into all sorts of fields, including your own, right? So dramaturgy is a word that's actually even in theater quite debatable uh, for us with Theater Meet You. Dramaturgy has these three important principles. It's the conversation of structure, time, and impact. And so the question is, what is the impact that any given structure makes over time on the witness? I'm gonna say it again. What is the impact of any given structure that it makes on the witness over time, right? And so these three keys are really, really important. When I speak to my students about dramaturgy, one of the best and silliest examples I give is a roller coaster, right? So we'll talk about that. So here's a very simple cartoony roller coaster, right? So this roller coaster is a very simple one, right? If you were at the top of the roller coaster, you go, it goes around and it goes out, right? So the structure of it, right, plays out over time. So this is, let's say the whole thing takes two minutes. So zero is over there, 30 seconds is here, one minute is here, minute and a half, you're upside down. So minute and a half is a little scarier, right? And two, you're at the end, so you're a little calm, right? So again, the structure, right, has an impact over time. Now there's all sorts of other things that can factor in how fast it goes, how slow it has in moments, how much it builds up. And that starts telling a kind of uh, an impact into the witness, right? We can get more complicated, right? It's a little more complicated. It doesn't have the who, right? But it actually simply travels through that. It takes longer, so the time is longer, right? So the evolution of it is a very different experience. And here's an even more complicated one, right? And again, that one is a whole lot of thing, right? And so I could argue that the structure, the impact, and the time is very different here than it is up there, right? So that the way it plays out and the way it impacts you is a very different thing. Now, for me, the key element in there is time, that there's an evolution of experience for the witness. And I'm using that word to open up the idea. So it's not just an audience, but it's actually the witness, the person witnessing the entirety of this experience. Now, this, we could discuss the dramaturgy of the roller coaster. So again, the idea is that word is a placeholder to bring in the idea of time, of impact, of structure. So you could say uh, the dramaturgy of that roller coaster seems really intense. It seems that the impact might be I vomit, right? The impact of this may be I'm bored. It was actually too simple, right? And again, I'm being simplistic. And the impact of this may be exciting. Now, again, we can play with all sorts of rhythm questions. If you've ever been on a roller coaster, oftentimes when you come up to a high peak, the roller coaster slows down. You know what I'm talking about? When it goes tick, 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 tick. It doesn't have to slow down. That's actually part of the design to actually make you feel like, oh my God, oh my God, ah, and then it goes down, right? It could just go, no, 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 at kind of even speed, right? But again, that shift the time is is, and again, she is even the structure and therefore the impact. Dramaturgy is everywhere, right? It truly is. It's in what we look at, listen, hear, uh, share, and so forth. Uh, I'll give us another very uh, uh, standard, which is uh, a song structure. Songs have a really unique dramaturgy. Now, there are some really exploratory songs, but there's also some formulas of dramaturgy that just work, right? So if you think about a pop song, think of the most standard pop song you can think of. It has this really formulaic dramaturgy, and it works, right? Oftentimes, that pop song would have an intro, a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus, a bridge, and a chord. So what happens over that is there's a kind of storytelling that happens, right? So oftentimes, if it was a, a dumb uh, a pop song, the intro would be like, Oh, hey, I'm someone, I'm so in love, and so forth, right? Something that, that introduces. And then the verse would begin to tell you the story. It would say, you know, and I'm so in love because you're so awesome, you're so great. And then the chorus would be, it's a terrible song I'm outlining here. Um, the chorus would actually be a kind of revelation, right? So all of a sudden it'd be like, you know, and because I love you, and the chorus would say, and because I love of my life, right? Ah, and so forth. And so when you're driving or doing something, you're like, yeah, and you sort of get the chorus, right? And then it goes back to the story, which is, anyway, so the first time I met you, I loved you so much, blah, 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 blah. And then it goes to another verse, because you're the love of my life. And you begin to get familiar with the structure, right? The bridge is often a revelation, right? And think of, again, next time you listen to a pop song, the bridge goes into a different tonality, and there's a revelation. So all of a sudden, the, the singer goes, like, you should know I've never been in love, and I'm really afraid, right? And it does that. That makes sense. <laughs> and, and then it goes, but you're the love of my life, right? And so it does that and it actually impacts you. It gets you excited. And if it makes you embarrassed, you would be like on the subway. And you're like, yeah, and you feel that, right? You feel the impact of the structure. 
So dramaturgy is everywhere. I'm obsessed with dramaturgy. Like your day has dramaturgy. This lecture has dramaturgy. Your class have dramaturgy, right? And so this idea is really, really important um, and, and I think quite exciting to begin to consider as we go into the work. And so this, again, the notion of dramaturgy uh, uh, becomes this conversation between structure and time and impact, right? And so I want to zero in the conversation a little bit more. So it's the idea of the dramaturgy of space, right? Which is a big consideration for us at the theater me to performance. And I would hope a bridge between your own field and the work that we're doing. So how and what is the dramaturgy of space, which is not just the structure and its impact, but time, right? What's the relationship of time to it, which I think is a really exciting conversation. Now, we can have a conversation about time on a lot of different levels, right? There is the moment to moment time. There's also a much more epic time. There's a way that I experience this building on a day to day, but there's also the way that the building can be experienced over hundreds of years, right? And so the question is, first of all, time, how it elapses, what segment of time do we want to look at? By nature of the work that we do with Theater Meet, we look much more at a moment to moment time experience and less at a kind of epic one, right? So we'll focus on, on that. So when we explore dramaturgy of space, the word dramaturgy makes sense a little bit? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm seeing like a lot of this. I'm like, I know, I'm into it. Not, okay, J just think of impact, time, and structure. These are the big things to think about. So the dramaturgy of space with Peter Mitsu, when we begin to explore the dramaturgy of a space that is going to be part of our performance, there are some key orienters that we have. Now, it's worth noting that for us as a group of artists, we often come in or invite into buildings that already exist, right? So we're invited to come into an art center, into a museum, into a gallery, sometimes into a found space, but there is a structure that already exists that we we'll come into. The first question for us is, what are the architectural inheritance there, right? In other words, what is that already charged with? What is it? What has it been? What do people expect when they enter the space? What do people expect when they see the space? Is it an exciting space? Is it a mysterious space? Is it a known space, right? And so that becomes a really important part of how we explore that, because immediately I want to push against those inheritances, right? If we were to be invited into a theater space, right, I would say everybody thinks they're going to come in here and see a very standard theater work. So how can we actually explode and explore that and push those boundaries to be inheritances? And again, inheritances are everywhere. Everything has these kind of iconographic values to the work, right? The next thing we think about is the aesthetic impact. In other words, what does it, what does it look like? What are the structures? What's the light look like? What's the sound, the design, the physical engagement of the witness, right? Like what is the experience aesthetically of being in that space? And then again, the temporal impact, which is how do we want to create a space that evolves, that has an element of revelation, right? And these begin to travel through the work. Now, that's a little bit of some lofty idea. So I'm going to unpack those in a little bit of a case study in a piece with Theater Me Too, just to give us a sense of that. So we're going to look at this, this case study uh, of a production of Theater Me Too is called Hamlet or Hamlet, right? So Hamlet, uh, if I say Hamlet, what do you think of? Shakespeare, a couple other things. Somebody said what? Sure. To be or not to be, yeah. Anything else? A little town. A little town, a hamlet. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah. The what? The Lion King. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, notice how quickly I don't believe any of you are theater majors. Is that true? <laughs> so why the hell do you know about Hamlet, right? Other than the small village. And it's because part of our sort of cultural landscape is woven in, even if you've never read the damn thing, maybe you have, maybe you were supposed to, uh, and you didn't. Uh, if you read half of it, it's going to go through the rest. Maybe you saw a film version in high school and fell asleep through it, uh, or maybe you love it, uh, and you love reading it, right? But it has a kind of iconographic value. We recognize it as something, right? Um, and Shakespeare, when I say Shakespeare, what do you think of? William, <laughs> uh, what else do you think? What do you see in your mind when you say Shakespeare? Yeah. What'd you say? <laughs> what else, what else? Romeo you know what? what was it? Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet, yeah, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, thank you. One more image? Yeah? So weird, like, sexy. The collars, yeah, those weird collars, yeah. Yeah, yeah, does that make sense? Can you see those weird collars? Yeah. Tights? Swords, right? Right. So 
for me, right, in the theater, Shakespeare's seen as a sort of grand inheritance, right? I don't like Shakespeare. I, I never did. I never have. I actually have a really hard time reading it. It may be because English is my second language, but I don't. I don't like it. It's boring. I respect and understand what it is as contribution to the field, but I don't connect to it, right? I know the stories. I've read the plays now 10,000 times, and I still don't like it. This is a very controversial statement in the theater world, just to let you know, right? Like literally when I'm like, if I'm in a room with theater makers or theater students, I'm like, I don't like Shakespeare. This is literally what happens. Oh, what? There's like outrage, right? Which is, again, this inheritance, right? Again, I'm not saying throw Shakespeare away. I'm saying I, Professor Melinda, recognize its importance. I, Professor Melinda, also have my own taste. And uh, I don't like it, right? And again, I just want to say that because for me, as someone in the art and as someone working through that, there's a way that these grand masterpieces were often shared with me. And the idea was you must love them. And if you don't love them, then you don't belong here, right? And I actually now push against that. My argument is you must understand them, right? You must understand the history and the context of your work, but you must also have a conversation as to how your tastes align with it, right? Does it inspire you? Does it spark something? And again, Shakespeare for me did. Now, remember, I worked in a theater company with a lot of folks with different opinions, and about half of my company loves Shakespeare, loves it, loves it, thinks it's incredible, and it's the best thing ever. They know to be or not to be backwards and forwards, right? I'm like, I never understood what the hell that meant success, right? And again, I like that tension, and that's how we explore with the company. So we started this exploration of Hamlet. If any of you think of the skull, right, is a big thing to your economy. Um, and started actually to bring this discussion and to bring this argument, not because we wanted to turn a show called Hamlet, but we actually wanted to bring the tension of all of these experiences, including actually the idea of a small town. But where Hamlet means something, right? So why would it only mean this? And so how do we bring those arguments and disagreements? And with my company, we're big arguers. That's how we collaborate, right? And so this is just a little bit of a, a series of traces of our arguments as we're mapping out and saying, no, but it's this, and why is it important? And how is it important in the English language? What happens when English is not your first language? Like all sorts of problematic things come up. We created this piece of work um, as a kind of conceptual space, and we were commissioned by uh, an art center in Abu Dhabi. This is what the art center looks like, right? So as we started making this work, oftentimes artists in the theater will make a work not in conversation with the architecture. They'll just make it and then pop it in. For us, it's not interesting. So for me, first of all, is about looking at this architecture. Rafael Vignola is the architect. Um, and seeing what is a community, right? What does it look like? To me, actually, if you can see it, um, it has a whole host of expectations, right? Already, the witness has a place. You sit your butt down. That's what you do, and you sit there quietly, right? Same in their other spaces, right? When you walk in, there's also a kind of grandness to it. It's hard to tell in that picture, but it has a grandness. It's an art center, right? So you're coming to see something elevated, and you're going to sit down. We're going to make you comfortable and so forth. So for me, I'm very interested in the kind of disorientation for audiences because that is to wake me up. Whenever I walk to something and it's new, I go, wait, what's happening, right? And there's a state of discovery for that. And so for me, it was about how do we push against that and what other space considerations can we take? Again, pushing away from the inheritance of what this is and into a space of exploration with this. So with my company, we continue to do a lot of work in India and we do a lot of research into temple architecture. Sure. There's an incredible uh, a temple that's in uh, Bengaluru, uh, which is called uh, Rakikura, which is a Hanuman temple, if you know any uh, of that language. Uh, it's a really fascinating structure. This is a top view of the ground plan of the temple, right? And so the, the temple itself uh, lays out uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of journey way, right? These little blue squares, right, are these alcoves where you would have the different deities, so there's different offerings that you would make. But there was an interesting thing that happened when you traveled, when worshippers traveled through that temple, which is you were invited to travel on your own through it, and then this massive musical event would happen in the center, and it would force everybody to come together out of just curiosity because you felt like, what is happening in the center? And so it brought everyone into this uh, central event, and then it let you go again. Right, and it traveled you again, which was actually quite exciting and quite interesting. And so, for me, this became a really interesting relationship to space, not necessarily to aesthetic because it looked very different, but I wanted to quote a different kind of aesthetic here. And so, we started exploring making these kind of alcoves in this art center. So, the first thing we did, we actually ripped out all the seats from inside and actually just wanted to shelf up the structure and started to be able to build these kind of uh, alcoves. This is a, a 3D rendering of it. Um, 
And again, the idea being to build up all these places holding a different kind of art venue, which is much more of a gallery space, right? So you're walking into a theater and you're disoriented by a gallery space. We also started looking at confinement, at spaces that could actually confine, and we started building these prototypes of these metal structures, right? Ultimately, the ground up from above, once you rip the seats out, was we started actually creating, this is a diagonal top view, we started creating these kind of alcoves, right? Where there would be these, these uh, performance installations, and then a central one that would bring people together. That there would be this disruption to your experience, first of all, by not just sitting down, but actually coming and exploring, which often has you talking to people. When's the last time you were in conversation and didn't get in trouble in a theater event, right? Where I'm literally Really walking and being like, so all of a sudden the audience awakens in conversation. So the structure invites a different kind of engagement. And then there's this big disruptive event that happens with sound. Um, and again, all of these were different meditations on this argument of Hamlet. Well, why Hamlet? Who cares about Hamlet? Should we have Hamlet? Should we burn Hamlet down? Should we put Hamlet up on a mountain? And so it invited this entirety of a meditation. And here, again, the sound that called people together was this incredible uh, punk garage band from Bushwick that we commissioned to write these incredibly angry songs about Hamlet. And they're actually in the second uh, level of this, it's the two level structure, which you'll see in a moment, um, and started giving structure to what become this production of Hamlet or Hamlet. Um, this is a, a, a kind of color version of it, just to give you a sense of scale and of folks, right? So as an audience member, you entered and you traveled through these, right? And again, made the space around, and so you were called for this group conversation in the center, right? Does this make sense of that idea? Have you ever gone to a theater event like that? Yeah, I, I love that. Like the best, the best way, way to describe my own theater me too, is I want you to walk into a theater production and go, holy shit, I've never seen anything like this. We're in, we're in, right? I want that disruption so that you listen and you feel and you have a different sensibility with the eyes of the mind, with everything, right? So this is what the work looked like. So when you entered, you entered this. Right, which is you actually have performers in there. So you have this multitude of stages all of a sudden, right? And several of them, right, as you travel through the work. And so some looked like this, right? Some capture different elements of it. And again, as you travel through it, you saw all sorts of different elements in the work, right? Then suddenly there was a big disruption. This punk band starts playing these angry songs about Hamlet. Why would there be these angry punk songs about Hamlet, right? Uh, and calls you into the center space. And this is what the center space looks like. Now, what was exciting about time is this actually happened three times. So you entered, you saw all these galleries, you came to the middle, you saw this big element of performance, right? And then you were free to go back to the galleries, and all of the galleries had changed. So suddenly when you walk, you were like, oh, let's go back to the one that's not here anymore. Right? And there was a whole set of new installations that appeared. And then you got called to the center again. And when you returned, they had changed again. Right? And so it also became this idea of, oh my God, did you have to be the one when I died? And you're like, no, it's gone. So all of a sudden, you as an audience have to become the messenger to this. Or you can be like, oh, the one that made me really angry, did you right? So all of a sudden, there's a different interaction in the experience. So now the entire the audience is like arguing and discussing Hamlet the way we did, right? And so somebody says, there's one over there, it's really boring. It's the way every, no, well, there's this one really exciting. And you see the punk band, right? So all of a sudden, we begin to create these multiple points of entry, right? And so all of a sudden, the structure and its impact over time is a huge consideration in the work, right? And furthermore, it invited a kind of awareness about space that pushed all sorts of theater inheritances as well, right? So I want to focus on this image down here. So... This is one of the installation spaces, right? I'll focus on it for a moment. So this is uh, a way that we manifest character, right? So we manifest character without an actor, just with this. So this is the character of Ophelia. If you know Hamlet, Ophelia is Hamlet's love and actually suffers quite a horrific death, right? And actually quite a bit of violence at the hands of Hamlet during the story. And so when this room is introduced, you're actually seeing her language for projected and you're hearing her language on this reel to reel, right? So at some point you're like, oh, lovely. And she's saying beautiful things. And you're like, well, it's simple nice meditation. There's these rose petals that come up later, fine. When you visit it later, there's now an after image, right? Which is the only manifestation you see of Hamlet. And that individual takes violence onto this room and begins to break this and scar the walls and destroy it. And you're like, oh my God, leave Ophelia alone. What Ophelia? There's no Ophelia, it's a room, right? Why would you have an emotional reaction to a room? And the reason is because we have an emotional reaction to architecture. We have histories with spaces, right? And with charts, and you have on some level 
your favorite room, you have a place where you feel safe, you have a place uh, where your grandma lives, you have a family, right? There's all sorts of spaces. And to begin to delve into that as part of the emotional landscape became quite exciting to us. Um, and so uh, again, uh, uh, this this uh, uh, work continued to, to develop and to shape business. I'm gonna show us a quick little, um, a quick little trailer of this, let me make sure that my sound is up. So this is a quick little sample of some of the images uh, uh, that I just discussed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you wrote us so many nice letters about the Shakespeare we did a few weeks back. Tonight, we're going to bring you a little more of the same. The play of Sam. A soliloquy that well reaches out on their departure from the young prince left by himself from mm -hmm. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Um, so those are some big thoughts. Everyone survived? <laughs> okay, I'm going to back, you know, for a conference. Okay, so I think we're going to... Yeah, um, I think what we should do is have a conventional Q&A in the lobby over lunch. That way we have enough time. Um, does that work for you? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, well, I think it's kind of in the lobby. Yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll all migrate to the lobby and feel free to come up. Thank you. I'm here for sure. Thank you, folks. Yeah.